Hey everybody, I am here with our special guest today, my old dear friend, Mr. Steve Dillard. Hello everyone. Steve's coming to you from down in uh, sunny... San Diego. San Diego. So, uh, man, I've known Steve for a long time. In fact, uh, we played at Disneyland together uh, years ago. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've always known Steve as just a great trumpet player, a super versatile performer. I mean, I've seen him play with, in jazz settings and commercial settings. And uh, man, you've played for some big artists as well. I mean, I know you've worked with Paul Anka and uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. Who else, who else have you worked with? I did the Dirty Dancing Tour with uh, the... Uh... Righteous Brothers. Oh, the Righteous Brothers. That's right. Cool. And yep. you've been like like a lot of us on this site. We are a cruise ship. We've all done a stint or two on cruise ships. So you've done that too, right? Absolutely. And what That's else? Fine. I would I would recommend for the uh, journeyman trumpet player, the young guys coming up, get on a cruise ship. It's the best thing that'll ever happen to you. It was fun. I would never, ever trade that chapter of my life, you know. Work every night. You can practice during the day. You can see beautiful sights in the world you never, ever would get to see. And um, uh, it's great training. Every night you perform. So every, you know, every night. And you got to develop consistency and learn how to take care of yourself and, and all of that stuff. I mean... On top of this, you've even worked in some some really like hardcore, like legit settings too, right? You've been with the San Diego Symphony and some other orchestras as well. I toured with the Montevani Orchestra and uh, I was a sub on the San Diego Symphony, the San Diego Chamber Orchestra and the opera. And um, so, yeah, I have, a, I have a little bit of a classical acumen. Mm -hmm. Cool. So in a nutshell, I mean, just so everybody knows, what what is a typical day like uh, practice-wise for Steve Dillard when you're trying to cover all this stuff? What uh, what kind of things do you do to keep yourself in shape and ready to, you know, jump at a moment's notice for any of these situations? Uh, you know, my practice routine is interesting, in fact, that I, uh, I really kind of wanted to get away from the books. I mean, obviously, you have to play through your Clarks and Carbons. I'm a huge Carbons guy, but I, I, I don't like practice rooms. You know, I don't like being indoors. So I used to make up. I used to go and practice in like storm drains and stairwells and avocado orchards and <laughs> any place that had an interesting acoustic. I would go practice in there, and so I made up uh, a routine of licks, uh, things to play, and. I want to be a better jazz player, so I would do it in every key, you know. Yeah, I saw the lick you po you posted up the other day, which was very cool. Got the lick. The lick came about uh, from the uh, Lori Frank book and the Scotty Belk book, and I, it was just kind of a jumping off point. And uh, and I started doing it on my videos, and everybody goes, "Oh my God, what is that? How do you do that? What do you, you know?" <laughs> I mean, I got confused for Danny Styles. I don't know who you, if you guys knew who that was at the. The great trumpet player used to play with Bill Watrous, and he had he had a chromatic thing that he always played. It's like yeah. you know, it, you know. So anyhow, I had this um, this this lick that's a flexibility lick, and it's I'm and, and it's uh, available to share. Just contact me, and I'll send it out to you. It's a lot of fun. Keeps you. Oh, in very nice. Uh, maybe you wanted to. I wonder if you're able to post that up on the on the site. That might be cool for everybody. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. Think about that, yeah. Well, that's cool. Interesting that you're playing in different settings and stuff like that. I always know that um, I get in certain settings, and uh, they're really conducive to me feeling great, not playing too loud. They're reverberant and all that stuff. And then you get in these rooms and stuff where it's just completely dead. And uh, that really messes a lot of people up. And I know it's messed me up personally in the past. And so I've learned what I got to do. But how do you control yourself in a setting that's like that? I got to learn not to overplay. You know, I play. So I do a lot of musical theater. And that's always great. I just love that work. And I work at the La Jolla Playhouse. And 
the Old Globe and the Civic Theater downtown San Diego. So playing in that controlled style is great. I love it, but I also do a really loud uh, rock band. So uh, and it entails um, earplugs. <laughs> yeah. and, and I have to remind myself not to overplay constantly. Yeah. Flip on microphone and uh, and I'm reflecting off my iPad that I read sometimes and and it's still just way too loud. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a bane of a lot of trumpet players is overplaying, you know, oh too loud, too too much and then you're spent. You know, yeah, exactly. And, and websites for uh, people 50 and over um you know, at 66 um yeah, I know. 60 I'm not judging here. Wait, let me get my. Mm, at sixty six. Question then for you. Yeah, um, you know it's it's tough to keep up. It's like yelling at the top of your lungs for a whole gig. You know, yeah. like you know. Um, oh, what a beautiful morning! And then if then in this rock band, it's hey, what a beautiful morning! <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, please. So. Well, and it becomes ineffective, you know, playing like that just. You know, I guess if you're playing in a rock band horn section, it's probably not as ineffective. But um, on a musical level, it's, you know, playing loud and uh, it's just basically unmusical. Well, it's, it's not about the horns, I'll tell you that, you know, or it's not about what's, what you hear on stage. It might go out in front, you know, you just have to pin on, on the sound man in the house. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, that can be a crapshoot. I've... I've worked with the uh, Four Tops and the Temptations for over 25 years. And when you do those shows, they don't even have monitors for you uh, nine times out of 10. And then you're playing and then people in the audience after the show go, wow, we could barely hear the horns sometimes, you know? Those, I, those are just so funny. It's, I did a couple of those gigs uh, recently and, uh, and it's the music's gonna, the quote of the day, from the trombone player, sage to veteran. He goes, says the music's gonna sound just like the horn, no, the music's gonna sound just like the charts read. And that's, you know, the temptation, <laughs> just an ugly, ugly book, you know, with yeah. scratches and scribbles and, and, and made up parts and uh, made up repeats. And well, and then skipping, we're gonna jump from the end of page one over to the third measure of page three, and then we're gonna go to page two and then take the coda and out, you know? Yeah, and watch for my cue. Yeah, you got 45 minutes to rehearse the whole thing and then, you know, hopefully you remember. And don't write in my book. Yeah, That's don't write it. <laughs> the thing to do in those situations would bring yourself little uh, stick it. I, 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 just, I would, that would, that would be, that would solve the problem. I bring them for the whole section, man, just cause. Yeah, well, that's who you are. <laughs> well. Yeah. I mean, it's like I've done a fair amount of uh, musical theater, you know, and I love I love doing that. And uh, those guys are really great at knowing how to edit well, things I, and I, do I, things on the fly. I do developmental shows here. I started out, uh, like I did the Jersey Boys. I did uh, Memphis. I did uh, Oz. I did Charlie Chapman called Limelight. Um, I don't know, uh, Huey Lewis and the News, uh, Heart of Rock and Roll show, uh, Margaritaville. Um, anyhow, those guys, I mean, they hire copyists. You know, I mean, you do those yeah. shows, they hire copyists, and, and you get your part in the, in the morning, and you rehearse, and everybody goes, oh, well, that's exciting. And But, yeah, back to the rock and roll things, ugly, and get yourself some Post-its. That's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's take a left turn here because I'll tell everybody a, a very brief story. But uh, when we were when we were kids, uh, we were working at Disneyland, and I, that's how I met you. I remember, and I needed a case. I needed a gig bag, and you had already um, kind of gotten into this gear business. Uh, which was very interesting, and I, I always liked it. I should have brought it down because I still have the bag upstairs, oh, but right. uh, and I still use it on occasion. But I bought my first gig bag, a double a double case for Flugel, 
you know, trumpet and the inner sleeve. And, uh, and you were uh, you were still at your mom's or you were selling that out of your mom's garage, I think. Oh, the story is, man. This is that's a great story. I like telling it. Um, so that was the era of everybody had a hip leather gig bag. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Here, let me see if I can find one here. I just happen to have five or so because I love leather. Right? Oh, yeah. Little, you know, <laughs> flugel gig bag. So anyhow, I um, I went to, oh, I think maybe it, when I first started, I was working on cruise ships and we, we docked in San Francisco where Reunion Blues was made. And so I went to the shop and I, you know, looked around and I bought a bag and then there was a huge, like, you know, cardboard box full of just cases just thrown in there. And I go, what is this? He goes, oh, these are seconds. And I'm going, oh yeah. I go, are they for sale? He goes, oh yeah, they're uh, forty percent off of wholesale. Mm -hmm. Wow. And off of you know dealer price. Mm -hmm. I'll buy every one of them. So you know, at the time, I think I scraped together like twenty five hundred bucks, and um, and uh, they were either shipped down or I went up and got them. But I had a VW, and I told you I, I worked at Disneyland kind of on the off during I was a seasonal employee yeah so I was there for like a 35th anniversary the 50th anniversary about four years of fanfares for Christmas and New Year Thanksgiving yeah. thing and um so my this is this is so funny because uh I had a Volkswagen bug and I filled up the bug full of these cases and then I would like the, you know, the day everybody got paid at Disneyland, because we got checks then, you know? Yeah. The day everybody got paid, I uh, would show up in front of the employee gate where all the musicians came out in my Volkswagen with all these cases kind of falling out of the, and everybody would buy one. I mean, sax players, trombone players, trumpet players. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was getting their, their bag at wholesale, and I was making 40% on that. And it just... You know, I'm going, wow, that's pretty easy. And that kind of started my penchant for, you know, retail, hotel, uh, wholesale type stuff. And then. Well, then, yeah, because now now you're full blown with the horn trader. And I know we've we've done some business like that. And I've referred people over to you and this and that. But you seem to be like really. For me, I think you're really special in this regard um, because you really know what you're talking about. You really know the instruments you got and you have just such a great uh, presence online and the way you <laughs> introduce your little friends and, yeah. and all that stuff. It's, it's yeah. really entertaining, but it's fairly really educational as well. So I, but t how did you get started like full, like into the whole horn trader thing? Well, Interesting, interesting story. Uh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> More me. Um, I worked at uh, 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 Colicchio in the late 80s. That's when they were in Hollywood? Late 70s. Late 70s. So, um, right. Um, They're in Hollywood. My friend Jim New, you probably a lot of trumpet players out there know Jim New. He was a... Yeah trumpet player at the time at, at Fullerton and that's where I knew him I was going to school in Fullerton and um he started working for uh Calicchio and I you know I didn't have a mentor or a, or a college plan I was in junior college my uh my mother was ill and uh I just didn't have I didn't have a great sense of direction I'll be honest and so I, I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm 24 now, and I want to be a trumpet player. I, I think I got it. I think I know what to do, you know, but how do you do, how do you improve? How do you become, you know, this entity? So I started working at Colicchio. I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm going to surround myself around trumpet players and, you know, mm -hmm. a dumb idea, but it was a direction. You know, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey, right? So well, yeah, and your your career, your life never goes from point A to point B. It it zigzags all over the place while you're getting there, but you do have to have kind of a an end goal in mind, I think. Right. So I went to uh Clicchio and I worked there uh a year and a half. And uh, 
I was still living in Orange County, driving up to Hollywood every day. And uh, I did meet, you know, some great trumpet players like, you know, uh, met Freddie, met Doc, met Oscar Bashir, met, met Sweets Edison, met a lot of local cats. Oh, my favorite guy was Conti Condoli. Oh, okay. He uh, backed over his um, Martin committee with his Austin Martin. <laughs> <laughs> laugh about that but uh so he was coming in every day after taping the tonight show and uh playing a horn that dominic was making for him and he would tweak it and say but i would take my break my lunch break every time conti came in and i'd be this close to him you know watching him and playing with him and not play with him but watching him play and talking to him and, i mean I, his sound and his ability to play was just phenomenal and i think that you know, that sound and that, uh, the way he played really kind of, uh, uh, was kind of a sent a message to me. It was something that I could uh, identify with. Like, I don't, I want to play like that. That Yeah. We, we all, we all did. We all did. Yeah, that's, the style, that's the way I want to play, especially when, you know, he recorded all that stuff with, uh, uh, super sax, you know, and those mm -hmm. songs. And I dig it deeper and he was, you know, a couple albums with Frank Rosalino, and I'm just going, wow, you know. I so, saw Super Sax once at Disneyland, and it was amazing just watching it live. Yeah, yeah, that was great uh, growing up in San, or in uh, in uh, Orange County, for, uh, oh, yeah. having Disneyland. And also, the interesting thing about Disneyland was that it was a mecca for great players. You know, a lot of guys came up to Disneyland. You got your Wayne Bergerons, you got your... Oh, yeah. Uh, Eric Marienthal's, you got your uh, Tom Kubis, you got your uh, uh, tons of musicians. Yeah. And so, anyhow, back to Clicio. I worked there for a year and a half, and uh, he owed me money. He, I'll be honest, yeah, God bless him. <laughs> you know, he owed me about five hundred dollars, which wasn't much, but as a kid growing up in That's a lot. Yeah, on your own and try to make it, and five hundred bucks was a lot of dough. So, I uh, I moved. Uh, I got a job at uh, Benj, and That's I cool. yeah, Jim knew had already moved and got me the gig. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it was close to home. I was living in Anaheim Hills, and as you know, Benj was in Anaheim, and right. I was in Fullerton in Anaheim, so it was nice and. Uh, uh, it was a hard gig for me. I mean, 7 a.m. every morning, it was, you know, just dragging my feet. In there. Yeah, well, Zig Castle was, a, you know, a stickler, you know, and. Uh, oh, I know. You're the first guy in and the last guy to leave, and, uh, you know, a bit gruff. I mean, there were some people that I think uh, didn't under maybe understand him. For some reason, he liked me, you know, I don't know why, but I knew him for a long, quite a, quite a while, you know, off and on. I think that was his persona. He had this gruff exterior, but he liked everybody. You know, I mean, he would go, man, are you fat? You know, <laughs> I go, well, I might be fat today. I can go on a diet, but you're still an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I introduced a friend. I took him down to Anaheim. I had a, uh, when Zig left Benj many years later, I wound up uh, getting, endorsing the horn, getting an endorsement uh, thing with them. And he built me a beautiful horn, a beautiful flugelhorn and trumpet and everything. And uh, so I used to go down there to see him or get the horns tweaked or fixed up or dents taken out or whatever, whenever I was down in Southern California. So I took a good buddy of mine from up here down there. And we walked in and I introduced him and I said, I want you to meet Zig Cancel. I said, he's the greatest, you know, trumpet builder he's the most fantastic this and that and I went on and I said oh gave him all these accolades and he just looked over at me and he said is that all <laughs> 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 but he could be funny in his own way but uh, he he really knew horn so so then you worked at so you worked at Benj what were you doing there at Benj uh, uh, well um I started out as a slide maker making tuning slides mm. and like the real good guys can make like two dozen a day and I was lucky if I finished 10 you know I was like such a perfectionist as oh a little solder ooh, you know rub it off and I wasn't very good and I could see I could feel zig looking over my shoulder just and I'm going, oh you know it's just yeah you but know, you know I'm shaky because I know you know he's gonna fire me and uh so I uh 
I graduated from there and I went into the, um, uh, oh, I was the inspector. I was the uh, pre-assembly inspector. And, uh, and that had to do with uh, the horns before they got plated and after they came back from the mounters. So there was a couple steps in there, but I would just pick up the horn and being a trumpet player, uh, I could quickly feel it if, if there was something missing or the balance was off, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like a brace missing. And then you rub your hand across the bell and you, you feel a little wave in it and you go, oh, you know, it's got a little wave and it goes, oh, it's okay, you know, or, or you see a little nick in the, in the, uh, in the buffing job or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's my job, and then when I finished, you know, I would probably see like 50 horns a day. That went by pretty quick. I uh, polished. I was a super polisher, silver polished. I hated that. Um, it always, you know, you're always dirty. Wearing gloves is clumsy. It was always weird. Yeah. And, and uh, I helped in the back in the shipping company or shipping department. And what else did I make? I do. Oh, I was. Um, a helper in the uh, plating, in the or degreasing. I would get them ready for the platers to plate. Mm -hmm. So you stick them in a big hot vat of some type of solvent to, to get all the solder flux and and uh, dirt off of right. them. Were they plating in there at the time? Yeah, they were. They plated okay. there up until uh, closing, actually. Yeah. Um, a funny story about that is well, let's see. Uh, oh, and then I uh, I would take brass. I would drive the uh, drive the company truck over to the, the scrap yard and give them our uh, our brass uh, recycling, you know. And I would pick up supernumeraries at the at the uh, airport. So I was kind of a, you know, jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. so that's on the trumpet. Every once in a while I get to test them. John McIntyre, if you remember that name, was, oh, yeah. uh, was the tester there. So he was in the same room that I was in. So sometimes if he didn't show up or was late or he needed help, to get out quicker that I would help. There was a, also another guy, Pierre Michelou, right? A French guy that used to work there too, test? Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, Pierre. Tester, but he was certainly active uh, that, at that time. He lived in Long Beach and he was uh, playing uh, around and um, he was at Disneyland. He was also yeah. went on the road with him to Southeast Asia with uh, Dennis Dean at a touch of class. <laughs> well, it's a, what's amazing about Southern California trumpet players, I think, uh, there's so many people that are world class that have been on ships or they've been at Disneyland, <laughs> you know, based out of, uh, out of Southern California there. Uh, yeah, Wayne Bergeron, not to name drop, you know, he was, uh, he was my uh, roommate on the ship and uh, good friend stayed at my house when he was having uh, domestic problems. <laughs> well, I remember just him just as a young guy, what an amazing talent he was seemingly yeah. from almost day one, you know? I mean, just something very special about the guy. I, I, uh, I was, uh, the first time I was introduced to Wayne, uh, there was this uh, battle of the bands and I was uh, in a band called Danada, which means nothing, you know, it's like those top 40 Latin bands that play, yeah. but you make your bread and butter doing quinceaneras and, and funerals or something. I don't know. <laughs> and so we had a panel of bands at Pasadena City College and eight and uh, Wayne's in a band called Ace, you know, powerhouse Ace, one of those big fancy names. And, and so um, we do our set, and I think we our big hit was like you know play that funky music, white boy, and uh, you know then a couple of rancheros, and then we're out of there. And they come up there, and they their first tune out of the hat was uh, gonna fly now. From oh Boston. wow! <laughs> and of course Wayne just pace the high A at the end, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and he's got the solo, da, 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 we, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and all the guys in my band are going, uh, you, you know, like, they're looking at me like, how come you can't play like yeah, that? Yeah, get his number. Yeah, so uh, that was my first uh, Wayne Bergeron experience. Uh, with oh, the cool. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's move back, back from Benj then. So I, I want to figure out, just get back to your, 
uh, Horn Trader. Explain a little bit more about Horn Trader, and then I'll, uh, you know, we'll talk about that, and then I'll let you uh, let you get on with your day. So Horn Trader, um, obviously, uh, I knew a lot about horns. Uh, I was kind of dabbling, uh, selling horns, trying to get the best horn for myself, you know. So I was always up trading and 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 trade, uh, you know, selling and buying and trying to get the best one and you know, like a little, little trumpet junkie. And uh, uh, I was on the road um, a lot. And so I was hitting different shops and different uh, uh, pawn shops and horn shops and stuff. And, and that was fun. And then uh, I was on the road with Paul Anka and I got fired. Yes, I did. Uh, but he called me back. But then I said, I'm, I told him, uh, it would interfere with my uh, my uh, unemployment check. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, uh, but I, uh, it, it happened at an opportune time because um, uh, my wife was pregnant, uh, and uh, with our second child, I was already on the road while my first child was being uh, raised, and I, you know, stay at home dad, but I go out on the weekends and stuff. And, so anyhow, uh, my second child was, um, uh, was due in January. My last gig with Anka was in, uh, was New Year's the, you know, the following year. So, mm -hmm. uh, my wife goes, you know, you need to stay home. You need to get a job. And I'm going, uh, really? uh, 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 and she goes, you know, you, you're all always on the computer and you like trumpets. Why don't you try selling trumpets online? This is 19. 98 when horntrader.com uh uh you know went live mm -hmm. and um uh it's been you know a couple different permutations but um i was the first i what i there was a uh the website was just booming i mean the uh the dot com business was just booming mm -hmm. everybody had a dot com or wanted a dot com or whatever and so I looked into it. I looked into getting a merchant uh, account and uh, credit card uh, servicing abilities and figured out how to get PayPal, people to buy PayPal. And this is before anybody. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people who have copied uh, the whole Oh, yeah, thing. there's always that. I mean, there's people that have, you know, permutations of your name, you know. <laughs> you know, horn trader this or the horn trader or whatever. I showed up in, in uh, I guess it was Colorado. Yeah, I know that store because, well, both our kids go to school in Colorado. Yeah, right. so I've been there. So they put me next to a guy whose shop is called the Trumpet Trader. I'm going, yeah. hey, great name. Uh, did you happen to Google before you, I mean, or... so anyhow, yeah. So I don't want to bad mouth uh, that guy, but that was a little, that was a little weird, a little weird. And now he's trying yeah. to well, you got you got a different thing that you do, a different service you offer. A, 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 I think a more varied service that you offer. I mean, like, you know, we've done some business and sold horns and bought horns and stuff, and it's I always feel comfortable, you know, knowing if you've gone through it. And I certainly feel comfortable when I've told students or other friends to go go see you. And I know you come across some really uh, interesting instruments you know i'm not much of a gearhead to be honest i've been very happy with what i got because i'm afraid once i start up trading and doing this and that i'm i'm never gonna stop you know i uh it was interesting during the uh the the financial crisis in uh 2007 2008 so i've already been in business for 10 years by that time right mm -hmm. uh all these trumpet players who are kind of aging out or finding themselves, you know, kind of like in the situation that we're in right now, you know, with the economy, uh, they're starting to sell gear They're They want to sell their gear and who are they, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy. So I'm getting, you know, uh, uh, big name clients and, um, uh, you know, symphonic people and commercial people and everybody's just trying to like, you know, make a few dollars on their horn stash, their cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, 
I started consignments. I mean, it was from from trying to, to find all these these horns and buying myself. Suddenly, I had this new opportunity to do consignments, and that was that's kind of what kicked Horn Trader uh, into the next gear because uh, no uh, no uh, financial output, and uh, you collect a commission on the back end. And uh, some of these horns were so good that I felt like I should play them or show them off on YouTube, you know? Well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, you not only does it bring the trumpet to life, but your narration, your personality, and, and of course your playing, I mean, you really get a good sense of, man, that's a great horn. Now, I, the other... Outside of the horns, you've also developed a line of mouthpieces, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you've done with that? Well, um, in search for the, the elusive double C, uh, I, uh, you know, was looking different mouthpieces and, and I was playing on a one and a half C at that time, maybe. And so I kind of downsized to a three C. And then I found out how comfortable these Mount Vernon 3Cs are. And I had several, or a Mount Vernon 3. And um, so I contacted, uh, I contacted a couple of players, or uh, uh, shops. Uh, and I had passed through Reno uh, with Anka uh, and went over to see Mark Curry. At the oh, time. yeah, he was my, room, my roommate on Ray Charles' band. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. So he, you went out with Ray Charles. I didn't know that. That yeah. was, everybody's going out with like uh, Woody Herman or uh, uh, Buddy Rich. And I know. I always wanted to, and I wound up with Ray, but I think it was, no, it was I, a blessing for me because the music was super cool and we played all over the world, man. It was nice. Oh, I love Ray Charles. Oh, I, yeah. I, I brought my kids up on Ray Charles. I made sure oh, they. Yeah. Yeah, Ray Charles. My there. dad played Ray Charles music when I was a kid. That's one of my the things that kind of got me into music and listening to trumpets and bands, you know, and all that. I thought he was cool. Yeah. So anyhow, I got a chance to uh, demo these horns, and then people go, "Oh, you sound pretty good. Do you teach?" And I'm like, "Yes, I do." <laughs> so I, I was. I'm always. I mean, not always, but. I don't mean to blow my own horn, but uh, I was the first to have an internet business selling trumpets. Uh, probably the first to do consignments, first to do YouTube, and probably the first to teach online, or one of the first. And um, and so that's been, you know, if, if I have young kids, my kids are 20 and 21 now, and so they kind of keep me current, you know, and mm. uh, and that thirst to learn new technology. Although I've kind of suffered in the recording and notation. Um, uh, me, me too. I'm way behind the curve on that. Aspect of being a musician, but uh, I'm uh, taking the uh, this pandemic uh, recession uh, time off to learn uh, notation. So once again, if you want the lick or you want some warm-ups from the horn trader. I have printed them out on Sibelius and I'm working feverishly to uh, transcribe uh, solos and stuff. So it's, it's going well. That's, that's awesome. Well, feel free to post, you know, post up some of that stuff that would be, you think would be uh, pertinent and helpful to the, to our uh, friends on our site. I think that's, that's really cool. I mean, you have had uh, a really amazing and varied career in life and uh, it's cool I mean in a sense you're you're a little bit like I am once I had children I mean when I was with Ray Charles we were in Italy one time and the musical director was shaking his head this was in the day of smoke breaks and the bus would stop every couple hours and we were on a bridge on our way to the opera house in Milano where we were going to play um, that evening and he was shaking his head and I said what's the matter he said, you know, today, he said, my daughter is uh, turning 20 or whatever. She's graduating from college. I've been out here on the road for 20 years, and I don't feel like I even know her. And that day, I said to myself, you know, you have had such an up great upbringing with, you know, my parents were great. And that if I ever had a family, I needed to be there for them. So 
I, you know, I eventually settled down and all that stuff. And, and in order for me to stay in town, I started a talent agency. I moved up to Seattle, as you know, and, and uh, so that keeps me busy, both playing and booking and hustling work and all that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of very similar in that way. Um, you know, I moved to uh, San Diego because uh, there was more work opportunity. I mean, I would have never played with the L.A. Phil, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> you know. But I managed to play with the San Diego Symphony. I managed to do – I would never play at the – Pan, or, you know, if I would have waited out, I could have played maybe at the Pantages, you know, or done those big shows, the Amazon and all those. But, you mm -hmm. know, I got, um, I got in here at the San Diego um, uh, traveling show business. And, um, you know, so it's it was nice to be close to L.A., but – far enough that um, there was more work opportunity for me. Keeps those right. guys in LA, LA coming down here and, and trying to, you know, grab our work. Yeah. Don't like that. Well, listen, so if people want to go see you uh, online, go, go see you for either uh, maybe they want to take a lesson from you. They want to learn about some interesting horns or test out your mouthpieces. Uh, they can go to horntrader.com. And uh, there is an email link. I don't really want to print it out, but I can say it's my email is horntrader at mac.com. So if you want the link, you want some of those warm ups, you want some special uh, uh, information tips, uh, you can certainly uh, email me or just go to horntrader.com and there is a. Uh, I'll, a I'll put a link. I'll put a link on that underneath the video so everybody sees that, okay? And uh, thanks, Bobby. This is fun. I, I kind of came in going, oh, I don't want to do this because I told you I just smacked myself in the chops yes, yesterday and I'm like dwelling dwelling on that. But uh, it was great. Um, well, thank you for being part of this. Thank you for being on the site and for all you bring to the trumpet world out here. And, you know, keep on keeping on. And I'll look forward to the next time I'm uh, at a conference or somewhere down your way and we get to cross paths again, okay? I look forward to it. All right, buddy. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.